member through 2017 and uh, has been found at the Jenkins Neurospine Institute in 2018. He has a wide experience across the spectrum of treatment of spinal disease and is going to talk to us today about CSF leaks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Chapeau, um, I, you know, I can't echo enough the, the um, interesting discussions. It's great, obviously, seeing a mass, how a master perceives the minutia um, that actually all the details that make a difference in the treatment. Um, and that's, uh, it's great to see that mastery in effect. And, and obviously to get back to um, Dr. Fifi's question about how long it takes to get really good at these, it's a combination of exposure, but also the mentorship, um, because we can all learn lessons but on our own, but we tend to learn more impactful and meaningful lessons when we work with a mentor who can help us to interpret these things. Um, you know, towards that effect, towards that, that issue, I, you know, obviously I, um, I'm talking today about one of the little things that I have uh, tried to gain a little bit of expertise in and, and have learned from both some of the people in the room, you know, in the, the virtual room today, as well as my many other mentors along the way. Um, and certainly those who are a little bit, you know, behind me slightly in their training and, and experience, uh, certainly if you need help, obviously help will always be given. Um, as far as uh, where we go um, from the topic today, um, I'd like to, can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So I like to kind of look at CSF leaks as, a, you know, an opportunity, a challenge, a, uh, it's a chance to make something a little bit better than it currently is now. But I also tend to lump them together into the good, the bad, and the ugly because it kind of, you know, goes to the complexity and the decision making of what to do and, and how to, to manage it. Um, as far as uh, disclosures for today's talk, uh, I do have two patent applications that are somewhat relevant to, um, to today's talk, but those are currently unresolved. There's no financial ties to them at this point. And I have no corporate conflicts related to any of the subjects that we're going to be discussing today. Um, and, you know. um, as far as uh, spinal dural repairs go, we'll be reviewing a little bit of the literature, uh, the history of dura uh, surgery and dural repair and, and spinal fluid leaks, uh, as well as looking at what the different general treatment options are. Um, some of it is evidence-based and a lot of it is uh, just you know, competing dogma. Um, in particular, one of the issues that comes up a lot is with lumbar drains, use them or don't use them. Um, I'll be basing a lot of what we talk about on my 21 year uh, independent practice uh, clinical experience, which does not include my uh, six years uh, as a resident at Mount Sinai, my one year of internship and my one year of fellowship. Um, so overall, if you look at the whole thing, including those medical school years, I've been doing this for over 30 years. And, you know, it's hard to believe uh, the time does pass quickly. Residents, enjoy your time uh, because uh, it goes faster than you realize. Um, there, but over that, those 30 years, we have seen a fairly significant evolution of techniques and technologies. Um, and so it's interesting to watch and there are opportunities even today to develop new techniques and new technologies. For the most part, I'm not talking about intracranial dural repairs uh, as uh, that's a kind of a separate area of both biodynamics and uh, the biology and anatomy, but it's much of the literature on the lessons learned and the technology actually is derived from cranial work. Um, Going back to the history of spinal dural repairs, first described in 1888, uh, Gowers and Horsley took out a tumor of the spinal canal and they left the dura open and surprise, spinal fluid leaked out for days afterwards, but equally surprising given the fact that it was over almost 150 years ago, the patient actually had a fairly good outcome, did spontaneously seal up and had no known or reported complications from that leak. Um, of course, the uh, 
the complexity of imaging and, and evaluation back then was very different than today. In 1904, Cushing, commonly viewed as this, the father of neurosurgery, but he's obviously wasn't the first generation surgeon to operate on the nervous system. Um, he did resect the intradural cervical tumor and he described his delicate interrupted silk suture for the dura. Um, an elegant but somewhat brief uh, technical uh, description of much of what we do over 100 years later. Um, he did not describe any post-op wound leakage, um, but and a late wound picture actually looked pretty good. Since then, <clears throat> um, there are a number of uh, people who have used different techniques and technology to close dura. As I said, much of this uh, goes to the cranial literature, uh, mainly because there was not as much spine surgery, intradural spine surgery being done 100 years ago. Um, Interestingly enough, much as there is today in neurosurgery about clip versus coil, um, operate radiosurgery versus observation for many different conditions, there was uh, almost 100 years ago a debate as to whether you even needed to close the dura. Um, and, but, you know, in spite of that, there was a significant advancements. Multiple different uh, technologies were proposed. Uh, for using doing dural patches. Uh, and it was it really in 1960 with the cranial uh, literature, uh, Wallace and Mirowski published their experience of, of, of 540 cranial uh, dural repairs with patches um, from, from the war experience that uh, showed very clearly closing the dura does improve outcomes. Now, as far as spinal dural repairs go, this is there's a lot of articles and there's a lot of most of what I would call dogma out there as opposed to evidence-based medicine, but over 200 articles in the last 40 years that describe different techniques, uh, but there's no unifying clear guidance on specific techniques or superiority of one technique over another. And partly because each leak is different, the biomechanics of cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine are very different. Uh, as well as the nature, the location of the leak, et cetera, and the different types of leaks. What I like to call the good, the ones that I don't mind getting a call, the uh, Dr. Dura page, uh, is are the intraoperative uh, closures uh, that need to be done. Uh, they're good because it's right in front of you. You don't have to do any significant evaluation. There's really very little decision-making that goes into it. Uh, into whether you close it or what you do next. Um, these can be either intended or unintended duratomies, uh, intradural procedures versus the accidental duratomy. Um, there is some suggestion that minimally invasive procedures, even if you have a duratomy, are less likely to develop a persistent pseudomeningocele. Um, and this is likely due to the fact that the cavity itself has a certain internal pressure that's proportional to the the cube of the radius, um, and so the, the, or the ratio of the internal pressure to the surface areas, ratio to the cube versus the square. Um, so it's incremental. The larger the 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 uh, the area, the volume, that the the difficulty of having it spontaneously involute. It's important to understand before you get in there, is there any clinical history of the patient that is going to be relevant to the closure itself? Um, have they had prior procedures? Is there a puncture? Is there a hole? Um, you know, what's the dura look like? Has it been traumatized? Um, do they have underlying collagen vascular conditions? Um, in one case, actually uh, doing a dural repair um, on a patient who had suffered an electrocution, you know, he survived, you know, touching high voltage uh, cables. Um, but when we went in to do his ACDF, he had CSF pouring out of his disc space and had no dura at all there. And it's believed that the electricity ran through the neurologic system, entering in his hands and actually exiting through his feet. Um, and the path of least resistance was the fecal sac and the electrical transmission through the dura fried the dural cells. Um, radiation exposure is also a, a major uh, risk factor that you need to take into account. Um, typically, um, there's a number of different techniques of either running closures or interrupted closures. 
And just about any small suture can and has been used and everybody out there is gonna tell you what their personal preference is. Um, Duragen is something that came about in the last 20 plus years um, as just laying it on top to facilitate the and support the closure itself. Um, going back to um, the first uh, large series of dural repairs uh, and outcomes, uh, Bowman, Ru, Wang uh, published their, uh, their series in just about almost 25 years ago, showing primary repair bed rest and wound drainage. And by wound drainage, I mean subfascial wound drainage as opposed to lumbar drainage. Um, and they said that it just doesn't cause long-term complications having the durotomy and repairing it their way. Um, they did report a 14% incidence of dural injury. Um, you know, it's interesting to think that that's the, the incidence that people report uh, durotomies and, you know, different people report different rates. And obviously these are some fairly, ex the, you know, when you look at, you know, Bowman and Rue and Wang, you understand these are people who do really big operations. So it's not surprising to see it happen. Uh, but only 2.5% of their durotomies required a secondary reclosure. Um, and these are very similar uh, throughout the literature. Here's an interesting recent meta-analysis that looked at the overall um, complications and rates of uh, infection based upon the type of closure uh, that was done at the primary uh, closure. And one of the, this is uh, very similar to what I do. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, I don't have any connection with these authors directly, but I agree with much of what they're saying in that, that if you do a primary closure, it's often good to supplement the closure by either putting a patch or a superimposing a tissue graft on top of it, as that acts as a backstop to minimize and mitigate any CSF that might be leaking, uh, either through the, uh, the suture closure line itself or through any little spots that may have um, not been pulled together perfectly at the time. So the very common cause of uh, CSF leakage uh, is the unintended durotomy. Uh, and usually this happens during the exposure when you're trying to get down you, and you're trying to identify the, the epidural plane and uh, you know, maybe the dura rolled up into your kerosene or maybe you were passing a curette a little aggressively. Um, obviously reoperations have a, have a higher incidence of dural tears than primary procedures. So if there's internal adhesions, uh, these are important to understand. Um, typically, um, I personally always recommend closing the dura, although there are many people who advocate and we'll see um, there are some, there's some literature to suggest you can observe a, a durotomy. Um, but my principles are very simple. Get to clean dural edges and expose whatever you need to, to get to that point. Does that mean converting an MIS to an open if that's what you have to do? Okay. Or doing an MIS, if you can do it and you can see the edges and you can get it closed, uh, do so. Uh, sometimes you see that you, you get to a dural edge, but it's not a good dural edge. Um, and that's why I said get to a robust dural edge. Um, and it's better to have a good closure than a not so good closure and have and, and hope that it's going to work. Typically for a simple tear, um, I'll put either a small purse string, what I call an encircling suture, um, or if it's a long tear, even if it's a, a square tear, if the durus is still adequately spaced, there's a lot of redundancy and it has a tendency to stretch. So I may just run it longitudinally and pull the edges together as we do, as long as the wound is not under significant tension. Um, tension on a closure is always going to lead to tearing of the of the tissue. And that's true whether you're closing fascia superficially or whether you're closing dura uh, down at the, the bottom of a very dark, deep hole. Um, so always try to make sure that if you need to release more tissue to allow the dura to stretch a little bit more, that may help you in your closure. Um, but it's also important to understand if you have uh, a defect that you can't get closed without too much tension, then put a patch down. Um, and there are a number of acceptable patch materials 
Uh, personally, I, I prefer Alloderm because I like the tissue handling characteristics, but suturable Duragen, um, you know, fascia lata, uh, and many other tissues, both commercially available and autogenous, uh, can be used uh, very effectively in the spine. Uh, there are a number of uh, authors, including uh, some Dr. Betterson, who have published uh, the use of clips uh, to close uh, dural uh, either patches or uh, in durotomies. Um, in addition to using, or and instead of using sutures, uh, this was actually first described using aneurysm clips, um, and then subsequently uh, small hemoclips and other types of devices have been uh, proposed and, and are effective. This is similar to an interrupted closure, which is actually how I trained uh, in residency. We just did a bunch of interrupted closures and they work pretty well. Um, Putting Duragen on, um, I typically will only do for really large defects, um, and, but I will typically put uh, you know, either Duraceal exact, uh, if I'm doing a dural repair over top, there is some suggestion that it, it can also buttress your closure. Now let's talk about more of a nightmare situation, um, the ACDF. Not only is it a deep dark hole, but it's ventral, it's cord level, um, and the angles are very small to work in. But once again, if you follow the basic principles of get back to your clean edges, this can also be done. Um, one of the little pearls that I have found for doing really tight closures on cases, uh, for example, I get called in every now and then to help out a, somebody who has gotten into the dura on, on their case unintendedly in the anterior spine, um, so naturally, I don't want to go in and do a multi-level corpectomy just to get to the dura. Um, we want to try to fix what we have. And I have found that instead of using um, something like a Castro Viejo, sometimes if you use a Decker um, as a needle driver, um, that can work very well in a very tight space. Um, and so this, I'm thinking of a particular case I did recently with one of the orthopedic surgeons where we, I just was able to get a couple of purse strings around the durotomy, but to get to it, I actually had to expand the, the uh, bony opening, uh, take down the uncinate process more. Um, we were able to not, we took the, the graft out uh, to, they'd already put the graft in when they, by the time I got there, we took the graft back out. Uh, we removed the uncinate process. Fortunately, it was off to the side rather being at the middle. Um, but left enough of the bone that the graft went back in without difficulty uh, and the patient ultimately had a very good outcome. Um, but once again, this was a case where we harvested a tiny little piece of fat and went, after we tied it off, um, after doing a few encircling purse string stitches in the, uh, to close it in a watertight fashion, we then dropped a tiny little piece of fat on top of that using the tails, tied that piece of fat down on top of it. and then. Um, put a couple of drops of fibrin glue on top of that. Um, cervical spine patients, you can usually sit up afterwards without any increase in pressure. In fact, it usually decreases the pressure because the volume of CSF tends to pool in the lumbar spine. Intradural tumors, uh, you cut them open and then you close it up again. Uh, you, usually these are the cleanest dural edges you can get. Um, I like running locked, but I know that there's some debate uh, within, even within our department as to whether running locked or versus uh, simple running uh, is uh, the most effective way. Um, it just goes to show reasonable people can differ um, and still be absolutely sure that they're right. Um, Typically, if there is a defect, we'll want to close it. And sometimes if I'm worried about tethering, I'll actually deliberately put a dural patch in to expand the dura. Um, we have a separate research project that we're doing on pr prevention of dural adhesions, and that's a completely separate uh, to topic for discussion. Um, I will put Duraceal Exact on top of these closures. And if there's a fat, I put a fat graft over any area that maybe there's a little bit of weeping coming from, um, and I will just keep closing it until I see that there's no, no leaking coming as long as the, the, uh, the dura itself is robust enough to tolerate that. Sometimes, you know, that people with really ectatic dura, you can keep sewing it and you just keep leaking. And it's at some point you reach therapeutic futility. 
The bad uh, leaks are actually the far more complicated ones because the, the skin is closed. And so you can't just go pop in, close it and get out. Um, these, I lump the into this category, both the spontaneous leaks that come from a leak somewhere in the spinal uh, axis and they have positional headaches um, and you're, you're not sure where the leak is coming from, but also the un unexpected and delayed leaks that often happen after a spine surgery. Um, patient's closed, so it's, now you gotta decide, what do I do about this? First, you gotta make sure that you're not dealing with a different problem. Uh, there are some clinical syndromes where, that mimic uh, causing positional type headaches um, and so perhaps it's not actually a leak, um, but you wanna look for the blottable collection in the wound area. If it's post-surgical patient, uh, you wanna make sure you have reproducible positional symptoms. Um, and there is an extensive uh, treatment strategy for identifying and treating spontaneous leaks um, that involve a whole series of uh, subsequently invasive uh, diagnostic and therapeutic steps. But you've got to be able to justify an exploration of an area. Um, and so clinically, you know, once again, you want to look at well, what's the history? Um, what was their procedure? Um, and some of these spontaneous leaks actually have a history uh, uh, that involves trauma to the dura through one mechanism or another at some point in the past. And perhaps that just finally worked its way uh, free again. Um, there are also a number of collagen vascular conditions that are predisposed to either developing CSF leaks or fail or developing a delayed leak. Once again, we get into the electrocution issue and uh, radiation exposure. I can't stress enough um, that there, this is a huge problem for patients. If there has been radiation to the dura, the dura doesn't tolerate it very well. So this is what it looks like. Um, if you have a persistent CSF leak that's violated the fascia, um, this is a pretty significant finding. If it's contained within the fascia, more often than not, the, you can proceed a little bit more expeditiously. But once you have loss of the, the fascial integrity, um, you know, these have a tendency to work their way to the skin. And obviously that's a bad outcome. Um, one patient, I talk about the fifth ventricle for a reason. I had a patient who had uh, a, a metastatic thymoma that we took a tumor out of, and he developed such a large posterior pseudomeningocele that violated the fascia that when he laid down to get his MRI, he actually lost consciousness because when he was lying on top of the pseudomeningocele, he pressurized the rest of the, the other four ventricles uh, of his neurologic system, uh, and, you know, developed, you know, um, hypoperfusion. Um, and so that went away after we fixed his leak, but, uh, these are not insignificant pseudomeningocele's. Um, you know, if you have spinal fluid in your closed drainage system post-operatively, if there's any leakage from the skin, um, if there is a spontaneous case and you're looking at what the uh, opening pressure is on LP, it's typically uh, low, whether you're doing it supine or, or lateral decubitus position, uh, the different numbers for what's considered low. But um, if you see low spinal fluid, uh, and sometimes we'll even do a volume challenge um, with uh, one solution or another to see if they feel better after you put spinal fluid back into their system. Um, Typically, if you have a post-operative patient with a pseudomeningocele, you want to watch for signs of either aseptic meningitis or worse septic meningitis. Um, and this aseptic meningitis basically comes from refluxing of the pseudomeningocele fluid back into the rest of the CSF um, space. And that carries with it proteins from the uh, extracellular matrix that it's being exposed to. Um, and that can cause your aseptic meningitis, which does respond fairly well to steroids, as you would expect from an aseptic meningitis. Uh, Hemosiderin is a significant problem in the late uh, chronic pseudomeningocele patients. Um, it comes out of the solution uh, in the extracellular matrix, and it, if it, it can be deposited uh, on the surface of the spinal cord, causing superficial siderosis. 
Um, and that is a potential late finding in these cases, which in and of itself can cause neurologic dysfunction. Um, one of the interesting things in patients with uh, both spontaneous leaks and sometimes sm uh, small chronic uh, leaks is they can get a reversal of their symptoms where they actually start getting increased intracranial pressure symptoms rather than decreased. Um, oftentimes that's they've become accustomed to the low pressure headaches that becomes their new normal. Then when the drainage stops, they are no longer have the capacity for reabsorption in the arachnoid granulations. And now they are at a slightly increased intracranial pressure. Um, and so watching for positionality changes uh, where they're now more symptomatic um, when they are uh, lying down than sitting up or things like that. Um, arachnoiditis, tethering of the, the various roots is, not, is a somewhat common uh, complication of any durotomy itself, anything that interrupts and uh, results in tethering of any kind. Um, the, as the scar heals, it contracts. So it tends to actually pull the dura and the nerves even closer to the dural wall where in the, uh, the normal situation, they, they are separate from the, the dura um, and that can lead to symptoms uh, on a late fashion. Post-op imaging, uh, if you see uh, and you suspect it very frequently, we will get imaging looking for a pseudomeningocele, but be careful. Fibrin glues can look like spinal fluid. Uh, and in particular, Duracell Exact is hypo-intense on T1 and hyper-intense on T2, just like CSF. Um, and so frequently I'll get a call from radiology and be told, or from the resident who's look, spoken to the radiologist and the, or often the resident more than the attending. Um, and they'll be told there's a huge pseudomeningocele. Um, and the reality is it's not, it's just the layer of uh, Duracell Exact that's uh, covering the wound. Um, and there are a few clues to suggest that, for example, the lack of a rounded edge of the fluid cavity, um, you know, more of a meniscus shape of the, um, of the spinal fluid. Um, we'll tell you that, that that's just the, the solidified, the uh, Duracell exact that we put down, which forms a little meniscus in the laminectomy defect um, when they're prone, which then when they're supine, you wouldn't expect to see that meniscus shape. Um, so, and fiber and glue though, does look a little different than Duracell exact, but uh, in a late fashion, uh, much of the literature on the radiologic appearance of, of fiber and glue uh, comes from one article on cadaver works. Obviously the evolution of these things over time is not, um, is different than what it looks like initially. So one of the things that we've seen over the years is that small pseudomeningocele, as we mentioned before, with a pressure surface area relationship, have a tendency to resorb. So a small asymptomatic pseudomeningocele can usually be watched. Um, the, what's the threshold for small? Uh, typically, you know, a couple, one to two centimeters in diameter, anything larger than that, my experience has been, they tend to grow over time rather than shrink. Um, but any patient who's significantly symptomatic, um, sometimes it's a nerve root herniation through the defect. Uh, sometimes it's the, uh, the pressure relationship or it might be persistent chemical meningitis. Um, any of those certainly would push you to go in and do a primary repair. Um, obviously, if there's an abrupt neurologic complication, uh, we talk about low, with low pressure situations uh, that you can get a subdural hematoma um, and so obviously if somebody has a, a dire uh, neurologic deterioration, that's obviously the first thing we worry about, um, as well as coning down and other uh, neurologic consequences of spinal fluid leakage. But of course, patient chooses, they can, we can often be pushed towards a repair, uh, but ultimately it comes down to the surgeon preference. If there's concern about whether there is a leak or not, cisternography uh, still can, is uh, still done occasionally, uh, but very rarely. It, is, it can be quantitative uh, if you're looking at, say, pledgets in the, uh, in the nasal cavity, but for the most part, for spinal leaks, we are, it's more of a qualitative issue. You're just looking for 
how does the nuclear tracer wind up outside the, uh, the neurologic system? Um, and we know that there is a certain weeping of, uh, of, dura, of um, dura through the nerve root sleeves. It's believed to be 10 to 20% of the total volume lost, um, the other 80% being through the arachnid granulations. But there is some gradual leakage laterally through all the dural sleeves. But if there's this pooling at one level, it certainly is suspicious for the location of a lesion uh, or of a leak. Uh, but these are not terribly sensitive or specific tests. Um, one of the more recent uh, fine, uh, techniques is dependent CT myelography. Um, and one of the things that this has found is there's a, a newish entity uh, called the dural venous fistulas, um, which will lead to uh, a significant, some, in some cases, high volume leak um, out the sleeve itself directly into the venous system. Um, and this can be found by seeing dilation of the veins and filling with contrast, uh, intrathecal contrast of the, the, the lateral uh, venous system. So if somebody has a spontaneous CSF leak, they may develop symptoms typically worse when getting up better lying down. The next step uh, therapeutically is often just to do a lumbar or thoracolumbar lumbar epidural blood patch. Um, very often we will do that even if there isn't sign of where the leak is, just putting a patch into the epidural space prevents uh, spinal fluid from getting in large volumes down below that point, closing the space off, uh, essentially reducing the quantity of leak, um, as well as it acting as a barrier if there is an epidural extension of, of it prevents it, it restricts it uh, where it can be flowing. Um, but once again, if you, we typically like to identify the leak before we start putting uh, glue somewhere. So obviously MRIs of the spinal canal and the central axis, uh, the dependent myelograms and uh, you know, various. Uh, the, also in the bad category is you know, somebody's got a leak in a delayed fashion, you're gonna decide do you take them back or not? Um, typically this will be a three day or two day after the surgery. Oh, suddenly now there's new positional headaches. Uh, but sometimes, um, you know, you what got to sometimes patients will be on narcotics and the narcotics can lead to uh, symptoms that mimic uh, a CSF leak. Um, but if you see fluid under the skin, uh, you see uh, CSF in the drains and you see any kind of threatening of the wound, uh, then you've got to assume it's a dural leak uh, and act accordingly. Um, remember the, the the glues will look like CSF postoperatively, so don't be fooled. Um, typically, if you have a leak and it's in the cervical spine, you want to sit them up to be less symptomatic. Um, whereas for the thoracic spine, it really doesn't matter. And the lumbar, typically the pressure differential, you follow where they're comfortable. The ugly category um, is the ones where you really, um, these are the, the most challenging repairs that we have to do. Um, and these include patients with collagen vascular disorders, uh, milder ones like Ehlers-Danlos to Marfan syndrome. Um, all of these can result in uh, the really very bad dura um, that's difficult to close and to, to manage. Uh, Radiation-induced dural damage uh, is a huge problem. Um, large defects from, from dural resections, whether it's a tumor or, or some other pathology, um, and OPLL anterior procedures, um, obviously the incorporation of, of the, uh, the degenerative uh, discogenic and uh, ligamentous uh, inflammation resulting in essentially loss of the dura when you're resecting it. Um, and obviously these large anterior complications uh, from uh, these procedures can result in potential life-threatening delayed complications if you've got a fluid collection in your neck. Um, trauma with spine fractures, uh, thoracal lumbar uh, trauma, high velocity trauma, uh, gunshot wounds, 
uh, and even other types of trauma where the bones can fracture and then the sharp edges either pinch or tear the, the dura, even if the fracture is non-displaced, can lead to spinal fluid leaks, uh, either intraoperatively during a repair or in a delayed fashion. Spinal dysraphisms and myelomeningocele,s uh, as uh, certainly as the pediatric neurosurgeons in the room know, are some of the most challenging uh, dural repairs that we can do and usually require multi-layer uh, dedicated closures. This is where we reach deeper into our toolbox. Um, and some one of the pearls that I've uh, picked up over the years is to uh, try to tack the dural repair. If you can't tack it to dura, at least tack it to bone. I mean, get it on something um, and where possible, get it into the, uh, in contact with the arachnoid somewhere. Um, I've had cases where I've had to resect the entire dura circumferentially and painstakingly create a new dural tube around um, the area, but it can be done and you can do it. You can even sew it closed by, you know, if you have either a costotransversectomy uh, bilaterally, you can reach around and tack that dural tube ventrally um, and get a good enough closure that you can lead, develop, let the patient develop an, a new dural tube. Bilayer patches are actually very effective. There is uh, obviously literature in the, uh, in both in the cranial space, uh, and we actually have a publication pending in the J neurosurgery case reports on the use in the spinal system. I'll show you that case shortly. Um, and sometimes you've got to use more than one technique to get these uh, challenging cases closed. So here is a, a case, one of the, my nightmare cases. Um, this is a patient who had, um, some of the older people in this group may actually remember this patient. Uh, this is actually what it looked like when we went to take her back. She had had multiple spine operations. You can see the hardware still present here. Um, and she, when we closed her at the last operation, there was no leakage coming from this area. And this is what developed about, uh, a week or two after she went to a nursing home and came back to our hospital. Um, and there's really just complete loss of all the dura in this area, it just, it, it dissolved. Um, and so uh, we then took a patch, a bilayer patch, which was tented uh, internally, leaving outside edges. And actually the inner area was larger than the outer area so that um, as Cal, uh, would often say, um, you patch a boat by putting, um, you want to put the, uh, or you patch a bucket by putting the patch on the inside. So the water pressure pushes out against it. Um, and so on a boat, you do the opposite, you put the patch on the outside. So the water pressure pushes in. Um, and so we turned that hole up there into this, um, dural repair, uh, with a, a lot of, uh, six O vortex. Um, but ultimately this patient stopped leaking and, uh, we were able to get control over it. Lumbar drains are a very, still a controversial topic. Um, they are often used, um, and you can, some people will even do, uh, permanent diversions as a way of diverting CSF away from a, a spinal fluid leak. Um, Many patient, many uh, practitioners will use a lumbar drain as their primary treatment, sometimes even foregoing a direct repair if they think that the space and, and the tear itself are small enough that they will heal up on their own. Um, or they are used as an adjuvant. You do a repair and then you put a lumbar drain in and it's belt and suspenders on uh, helping the leak to close. Um, but what are the benefits? Um, what are the risks of doing, putting a lumbar drain in besides even the direct trauma of passing a drain into the, into the nervous system. Um, and what are some alternatives? So lumbar drainage has a very long and storied history, first described in 1909 as a way of treating menin septic meningitis. Um, and uh, in 1989, a, a report of 14 patients was published um, showing that it was an effective treatment for persistent spinal fluid leaks um, and these were leaks that they had attempted to repair, but had been unable to do so. Um, and then there are some that use CSF uh, diversion as the primary treatment. 
Um, obviously, the advantage is it reduces the pressure head uh, against your repair or against where the leak is located. Um, and that is obviously a, a good thing. But there are a lot of risks with its use. Um, you don't want to get over drainage from the lumbar drain. Um, you don't want to develop arachnoiditis. What happens when you suck out all the CSF, the dura collapses and it gets and can get very adherent to the, uh, the remaining neural elements, uh, and that can result in arachnoiditis. Uh, it is a new hole in the nervous system. And so when you pull the drain, uh, we don't typically put a stitch into the drain itself after we pull it. Um, and I've had patients come back to the OR for stitching a hole in the lumbar drain hole. Um, accidental disconnection or connection to an IV pump has been reported. Um, Obviously, you know, the KISS simple, the KISS principle, uh, keep it simple. Um, the more complexity you have in any patient management, the more opportunities for uh, a complication to develop. Um, that includes also over drainage. Um, you know, we've seen plenty of times where somebody has left it open and it's been dropped below the intended pressure gradient, or somebody has un, you know, opened it up for drainage and forgotten about it. And so these are all the complexity issues of keeping it simple. Um, and of course, most patients with lumbar drains are relatively immobilized and there are known complications of immobility. Alternatives include putting, using subfascial drainage instead of a lumbar drain. Um, and there are a number of studies that have shown, and that's been my practice and my training, to leave a subfascial drain for three to five days or until the drainage stops. Um, as it collapses and prevents a large pseudomeningocele from developing. And once that happens, it tends to involute from a small pseudomeningocele to no pseudomeningocele. Diamox is useful, but only for a couple of days at reducing the pressure gradient. Um, but in general, the best treatment is make sure you have a good primary closure and that you check for a leak before you close. So one of the things that I have discovered is there's really no consensus on what's the best way to do this. Um, and I'm gonna show you a little bit of the literature on some of my evolution of mine, um, but uh, I know we're running short on time. Um, some of this may be surgeon specific. There's a lot of dogma and not a lot of evidence, but there, as I've shown you, there is some evidence on, on certain things. Um, but a large observational cohort of multiple surgeons at a single institution might actually help to identify treatment patterns that are useful. So for example, over time, the suture that I have used has evolved from uh, you know, either no closure to um, a you know, Gore-Tex, proline, uh, Neuralon, um, and now I use almost exclusively Gore-Tex sutures. Um, I like the, the fact that the needle itself is the same size as the suture, so it doesn't make a larger pinhole than, than the, the material itself can plug. Uh, I haven't put a lumbar drain in in uh, over 10 years in a dural repair, um, and that's primarily because I think the risks uh, outweigh the benefit. If you can get a good repair, get, just get the good repair. Um, and, you know, interestingly enough, what the hospital stocks is what we use. And so um, some dural repairs, I won't use anything at all. And on others, uh, I'll use uh, Tisseal, Duraseal, um, Evaseal, Vistaseal, um, Nevaseal, wh whatever seal that the hospital gives us, uh, we may use. Um, but typically, for an, I use Duraseal uh, exact for dural repairs. And then I use fibrin glue just simply for hemostasis and neural protection, not for CSF leaks. So as I said, I like the 6-0 Gore-Tex. I like a running uh, watertight closure. I'll put a patch in if I need one. I'll, over, I'll just keep over sewing the, the edges until I have no leak with Valsalva. Um, and so, and as I said, I've had great experience in 400 cases of closing dura without having to put a dural, a, a lumbar drain in, in the last 10 years. Um, I use a fat graft quite frequently uh, if there's any question at all. Um, I like the consistency of fat. It's nice. It's easy. It compresses. Um, it doesn't cause a uh, significant uh, neural compression. It won't swell. Um, it's just, it's a nice, easy piece of material. Most people don't mind taking a little bit of their fat out from under their skin. Um, I will observe small uh, pseudomeningocele, uh, but I'll repair large ones if I think they're symptomatic. 
Um, I keep the, the subfascial drains on suction as long as they don't have crescendoing headaches. Um, anybody who's getting really bad headaches will get a CT scan and make sure that they aren't uh, showing signs of brain sag or um, God forbid, getting a subdural collection or hematoma. Ultimately, it just comes down to have a good repair. Any questions? Hey, Art, can you hear me? Yep. First of all, thank you for sharing your considerable wisdom on this topic uh, with our group here. In general, there's a lot of differences of opinions. I think I tend to have come around and learned from you over the years and have adopted most of your principles. I still use the lumbar drain, but maybe it's overkill or maybe I can pull back like you did. Um, my two questions are, one is, um, can you comment about the degree of leak or the degree of durotomy and how it affects your decision-making? Because sometimes, as you know, there's just an arachnoid and you don't see fluid. And sometimes you see a little bit of fluid and sometimes you see a lot. And how does that affect your decision on whether to repair? Because sometimes with the arachnoid, if it's a minimally invasive, maybe you're going to cause more problem and leak than, than you're helping. And so I'm just curious if you could share some wisdom on that. Yeah, I, obviously it's, it's, it's a comfort level. Um, you know, if you have, let's say you're at a surgery center and you have, uh, and you're, you're, you've done your three or four years into practice, you have a small arachnoid seal um, on a metrics uh, lumbar discectomy. What do you do about that? If you're not comfortable doing a, a, you know, a dural repair down that tiny little metrics hole, and it's just a tiny little bleb, there is literature to suggest you can just throw some glue down um, because it's a small cavity. Um, it, the odds are it probably won't leak. Um, you know, the fact that they had, you know, massive dural tears, um, you know, back 150 years ago when they were doing intradural explorations and they didn't even bother to close the door and those patients survived just goes to show there's a lot of what we do that you can take chances with. For me, if I see it, I close it. Um, and that's just because I I'm comfortable. I can get the stitch in and around and then I sleep better at night. I don't have to worry about it. Um, you know, I do worry about, you know, arachnoid seals popping later if they patient valsalvas. Um, and so that's just makes me sleep better at night. Um, but I'm a chronic overcloser as I tell the residents. Um, mm -hmm. And as far as the size and the quantity of leak, obviously, if you see a large leak, um, if you see it when the, you've already lost some spinal fluid and the pressure is low intraoperatively and the patient's prone, the, there's a good chance that when they stand up, it's going to get worse. Um, and so, you know, typically, if you see it close, it is, is, has always been my philosophy. Um, but, you know, as I said, there is an extensive literature on the use of dural uh, diversion, on the use of dural patch or other materials, glues and whatnot. They all have a failure rate. Um, and, and even primary closure has a failure rate. But the primary closure plus putting a, a fat graft down seems to have the lowest rate of having complications, having delayed revisions and having... Um, any uh, type of, uh, you know, I wish I had moments. Thank you. Let's see if the residents have any questions. If not, I have a part two. Okay, well, if not, then uh, the situation that we sometimes see, and you alluded to it on your the ugly slide that I don't think I saw it directly listed there, is the situation where you have a patient who already has arachnoiditis, not causing, not coming from the leak, and with spinal cord injury patients, as you know, delayed tethering, those type of patients. I have one I'm dealing with right now. It's a very challenging situation, especially because the dura has become ossified, and it's just consistent with the bone. And then at some point, the question is, if you get the skin sealed, and you still have a pseudomeningus seal, do you go back to get perfect, or do you accept the partial win, and sort of not get involved more, because you know, you end up, could end up in a worse situation? Yeah, I, I think that, as I said, it, in general, I try to, um, it, I guess it also depends. Are you starting off with known arachnoiditis and then you couldn't get it closed or are you starting off with? Well, starting out with arachnoiditis, we went to do untethering. And then, you know, because couldn't we closed. couldn't get a perfect closure, we have the skin closed, but not the dura. And now the question is, do you, do you leave it at that or do you go and, I'm not sure we can do any better the next time is the question, you know? 
Yeah, I hear you. And that's why I, I always try to, I'm, you know, sometimes you just have to be prepared to go bigger. Um, and that's, and, and it's sometimes the patient can't tolerate that in the procedure and that's a, a game time decision you make. Oh. Um, but sometimes I'll go back three to five days later, um, when they're, the, when the dural closure is your only focus and get that done. Um, oh, thanks but, again. I can talk to you offline about this because yeah, I sure. know it's almost short on the time. Thank you. Open up if anyone else has any time, but thank you for your wisdom. Okay, Peter, I think it's nine o'clock. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, All right. Thanks, Chris. everyone. Take care. Thanks.